Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 87 of Confessions of a Market Maker. I'm your co-host, Ray, a.k.a. All Day Ray, a.k.a. <laughs> Chief Ray Strongbow. <laughs> and I'm joined here by my suave co-host, former market maker of 20 years and current day retail trader, a man whose claim to fame is holding a stock up at 90 RSI for three months straight, the heartthrob of Eastern Europe. JJ. How's hey, brother. Good, brother. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. And I'm excited for our guest today. She is the CEO of the Algorand Foundation. Prior to joining Algorand, she ran the global market development practice at the Milken Institute. Prior to Milken, she ran the JP Morgan's public sector practice. Before that, she led the NASDAQ's two markets for micro cap companies. She's had senior roles at the U.S. Treasury Department, the Center for Global Development, and the Harvard Institute of International Development. Of course, I'm talking about Stacy Warden. Stacy, how's it going? Stacy, aka Stacy. <laughs> Stacy, aka Stacy. Stacy. I gotta come up with one of those. I need. I need an aka now. I'm realizing. I'll, I'll. I'll think of one next time we have you on. I'll. I'll come through and deliver. Stacey. All right. I'd love that. Stacy, it's a pleasure. Uh, you coming on? You uh, you spoke at the the Salt Conference uh, about a month or so ago. Mm -hmm. Anthony Scaramucci runs the event. We had him on the podcast. He's a character. We had a great time with him. Large investor in Algorand as well. Yeah. What, what have some of your dealings been with uh, with Anthony? How's he been? Oh yeah, he's you know he's a great guy. He's a very dynamic guy, and he's a good um, you know he's a good friend to the ecosystem for sure. You know we're mm -hmm. very glad to have him around. He does not ever miss an opportunity to talk about Algorand and, and it's, um, you know, what makes us distinct and what makes us a little bit more applicable for real world, you know, problems and coming as such a successful, you know, traditional finance investor. I think what he says is carries a lot of weight, right? Cause he's, um, he's got criteria, you know, he's been around for a long time and he's got criteria that come from a, you know, a risk management and a trad by kind of approach. And so, you know, when he blesses something and he, he is of course, you know, not single threaded to Algorand, but it's, you know, it helps us when he, when he's out there talking about us for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and he's fun and, to, you know, he's fun to have around too. He's, 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 <laughs> he, you know. he, he sure, he sure is. Uh, you know, what we, like we were speaking before, I, I knew going into the podcast I did with him, I just, I just let him run with it. I, you know, I feel like I barely even spoke. He was telling funny stories. Um, you know, you yeah. Know. <laughs> did you see his tweet? It was just a couple of days ago with his mother. He's got his mother in a, you know, I think I like they're it. driving. Yeah, it's like with the roof down. You know, her hair is perfect, <laughs> but they're in this convertible, and it's like here I am with Mama Scarlet, which is just so adorable. I love it. Love it. It's good. Good Italian, uh, Long Islander. Uh, My good Italian son. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Exactly. And uh, just a uh, reminder to the listeners: if you guys would like to join JJ, and myself, and a supportive community of traders, you can join us at microefutures.com. Uh, Stacy, you know, I mentioned all your prior experience in the intro. Um, and you got a part of, you got a part of my ignorance, you know, I'm just a retail trader from home who's like shorting BS companies, uh, you know, us being a trading podcast, you worked for JP Morgan, uh, you led the NASDAQs to uh, markets for micro cap companies. Uh, could you know, you just tell us what those roles um, entailed? Yeah, you know, let me, I think maybe the NASDAQ one's a little bit more uh, relevant for you guys. Okay. Uh, you know, at JP Morgan, I looked after our big uh, institutional central bank ministry of finance clients in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Um, oh, wow. But I was uh, a client exec, right? So I would bring the bond market guys to the trade, you know, not this trader so much, but the sales guys to talk to mm -hmm. clients. And then the next day I would be talking, you know, about commodities with the clients and then helping them kind of um, execute on deals that they were doing, but it wasn't kind of like a day to day trading um, kind of role. Mm -hmm. But at NASDAQ, we had uh, something called the over the counter bulletin board, the OTCBB. <laughs> And NASDAQ had a very good idea at the time. Um, this was in the late 90s. I guess this was 98 or 99. Yeah, 98, I guess. And um, they said, you know, the NASDAQ small cap was very successful, but it had financial requirements for small companies that small companies couldn't meet. So minimum asset requirements, minimum revenue requirements, that kind of thing. And a minimum share price requirement in particular. And we had the OTCBB, a lot of riffraff and a lot of kind of big companies too, like, you know, public supermarkets was on my mm -hmm. market, for example. 
And so the Nasdaq had a, a pretty interesting idea, uh, which was not my idea, but they hired me to, to run it, to, to keep the OTCBB and to run this market called the Bulletin Board Exchange, the BBX. And that would have the same corporate governance requirements of the Nasdaq small cap. So you had to have um, a certain number of you know, outside shareholders and all the kinds of corporate governance things that you think of, but none of the financial requirements of the NASDAQ small cap. So your share price could be, as, could be in the pennies, but it was a way for these um, OTCBB, you know, there's a, something called the lemons problem in economics. It's a way for, and the classic example is used car dealerships. So if you're a really good used car dealership, it's very hard for you to distinguish yourself from shoddy used car dealerships. And so this was kind of the NASDAQ's attempt to make these smaller companies have some governance hurdles, but it would be okay if their share price was really low or they didn't have you know, a ton of revenue or a ton of assets. And so that, that um, market is what I was uh, hired to run. That was, that was great fun because you know, I, I tell you, I love small companies, right? These are like real entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. You go on roadshows around the country and these guys are like, I mean, they're, like, <laughs> they're the engine of, of America, right? It was, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic gig for sure. It's so great to even hear you say that because that's, that's where I, I learned my craft on OTCBB. And right. that's, oh, okay. You know, so yeah, I, tell me, tell me about I, that. Yeah, I started in 95 on 95, 96 on okay, the trade right. desk. Right. And, you know, this was right after, I don't know if you're familiar with regulation S uh, after they shut that down, but I was in Vancouver, BC, okay. which was the portal for every single offshore piece of stock to come into the United States. Right. So, yeah. PSC. So, you know, I, I was, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I didn't actually trade VSC because Briex Minerals had happened right then and killed the Canadian mining sector uh, when they dropped that guy out of the helicopter. And so I decided to concentrate on OTCBB. And mm-hmm. it was right when, you know, Edgar, uh, the database came out on the internet. Yeah, yeah, of course. I was the first guy to, at my firm to even know that and bring it to our compliance officers so we could read up on things. And, mm-hmm. you know, so I dove right into OTCB and making market maker relationships and things like that. And it was, uh, it was great times. I mean, and we brought in quite a lot of liquidity because, you know, the internet was just starting to get, uh, popular. One of my clients was the first guy to tout stocks using email, you know, and we'd bring liquidity and volume. And then some of my more, uh, you know, uh, sort of, how shall I say it? Um, not so, you know, wise guy clients would actually graduate companies from the BB up to NASDAQ small cap. Right. And that, that was always lovely to see, you know, a ticker go across CNBC, you know, right. that was a really cool thing. So, yeah, those were really great days, you know. I, I yeah. Really and, you know, know, like the Madoff brothers were like our most important market maker. Exactly. Too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. I know. I met him. I met him at a traders convention, you know, one of the stainy <laughs> traders conventions. And hey, he wasn't really that nice a guy, but, you know, he was. You know, I was like, oh, this is the grandfather of the NASDAQ kind of thing. And yeah, little yeah. little did we know at the time, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the trading shop was probably a little bit different than that. But still, yeah, those were. And then, you know, what kind of killed that idea besides the, the dot-com crash, of course, was Sarbanes-Oxley, right? So mm-hmm. Sarbanes-Oxley, you know, and they got that thing done in like, what, 10 days. And it True. had an impact on small company markets and small companies that I don't think they, they fully expected. Or, you know, I think that they could have you know, thought it through a little bit better, they could have avoided some of these, you know, unintended consequences. But for example, you had to have um, a majority of your audit committee had to be whatever it is, but all of a sudden, and I, I won't even say, you know, it's, it's independent, right? But the majority, all of a sudden, you know, these companies that I had had audit committees of one person because they're small companies. Exactly. So there was this whole thing, like what's a majority? Does that mean I have to have three people, you know, by definition yeah. on the audit committee? Like stuff like that was really, really, and then of course the great delisting happened. You know, oh. that was the beginning of the great delisting, right? Yeah, that's right. I remember that mm-hmm. very well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Interesting. I, so- I did not cause the dot com crash. I mean, I was just there. Just, <laughs> just, just to put it out there. Let's, let's. You know, I joined, I joined Algorand, and like we're now we're in crypto winter, so I do. I'm a little bit, you know, sensitive about my, <laughs> my reputation as a, as a cooler. So I want to, you know, that's- I want. <laughs> I, I, you know, I was I, at JP Morgan during the great financial crisis. You know, if I'm in, well, this is confessions, right? This confessions. These are my, this is my main. These are good confessions. Confession. Yeah. I have a little and, bit of a, tend to and, always be around when things are bad somehow. And when Ray's done, I've, I've got to ask you about the, the Milken Institute, because I, I, I grew up reading about Michael Milken. He go was ahead. like, you know. Go ahead, JJ. Was, yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, um, I, you know, from a kid from Canada, you know, reading about, 
him at Drexel and, you know, wearing the miner's hat on his head, reading right. corporate reports. Right. What was he like to work with? I mean, I'm just fascinated by that guy, you know, the X-shaped desk at Drexel. And... Right, right. He is um, larger than life, right? So when I first started, so I worked there for eight years and wow. he is, um, he's an amazing human being and does not need any sleep and is very, and believes deeply that he can change the world. So wow. this is, if you work for him, a combination that keeps you on your toes, if, as you can imagine. Yeah, I and you know, do you remember, since you've, since you're, you've already kind of called me old by, by the conversation we're having now, do you remember <laughs> Hogan's Heroes, you know? Definitely, I Heroes? love, you know, uh, yeah, I see nothing, I, mean, I know nothing, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> But that was my first. Um, that was my first introduction to the to the searchlight. You know, and they had that searchlight going around. Yep, you know, the exactly. Yard. And this is what it's like working for Mike Milken. He's a very busy guy, and the searchlight is not always on you. But okay. you know, when it comes, when it comes, you better to be you, ready. It's, it's very bright. Yeah, it's it's extremely intense. Oh, cool. And he, you know, I would get these calls. You know, at eight a.m. My cell phone. First of all, when I first started working, I'd be like. Mike Milken's calling me on my cell phone. Like, <laughs> no, no kidding, eh? Wow, amazing. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, you have to do the math, right? It's like 5 a.m. in L.A. too, yep. right? You know, and no, yeah. But he's very, you know, he had um, prostate cancer, right? So he That's true, um, yeah. is very, he, he has a huge health life as well. Really okay. very much on the vanguard of, of uh, prostate cancer research in particular, but also kind of public health issues. And um, he's an unbelievable convener of, of people. And That's he amazing. and he will take, and he is very, very philanthropic and he's very committed to his causes. And he basically will take anybody that he has ever made wealthy and shake them down for his philanthropic. Wow. Oh, really? That <laughs> is so cool. Endeavors. Oh yeah. That yeah, is yeah, very yeah. cool. You, yeah. And yeah, um, yeah he said, he's an, and have you been to um, the um, uh, global conference, the Milken Institute? No, I, I haven't. I've just, wow. every, everything I know about him is, you know, just from reading. And, you know, when, you, when you're growing up and you want to be a trader and you're young and, you, you know, you read about him and right. how he could process like so much information and retain right. it, you right. know, and just basically he created a market with the junk right. bond market. I mean, that's to be around guys who actually create, have created a market. Like he's like a Louis Ranieri with, you know. Oh, right, Louis Ranieri, back. who I met a couple of times. No way, like, really? Yeah, oh yeah, totally. I was he's like, like my oh, hero. God, he's oh, like, he's, he's my hero. Yeah. yeah, he's, he's an amazing, all, all these, all these, you know, guys. Um, yeah, really. And, you know, he, Mike will say that he lost a lot of his competitive advantage when, um, the um, BA calculators came out because he, you know, could do bond math in his head. And now, you know, and then all of a sudden everybody could do bond math because they had the calculators. <laughs> he lost a little bit of a, an edge there, you know, so. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, you tell him a phone number and he will remember the phone number forever kind of thing. I wow. mean, he's got yeah. a kind of brain. Yeah. And a super nice guy and very um, polite as well. Very, oh, you'd be okay. courtly, like, like old fashioned courtly. Like the, you, oh, okay. you would think with that kind of, history that he would swear maybe a lot but he, mm. he he's a he's a mm -mm. interesting wow cool yeah <laughs> so you know stacy before we move on to like the the crypto sphere um you, you worked for the the u.s treasury department uh i'm just curious how, how was it uh working for the government yeah it was really interesting you know i i had a pretty good gig there because i ran something called the uh, tropical forest conservation act which was a pot of money that Treasury had, which we would give, we would forgive debt to, of developing countries if they um, would use the money that we forgave to preserve their tropical forests. So it was one, of, and you know, it was a small program. So it was kind of under the radar of everybody else. So it was like a 40 or $50 million program annually. And um, it was one of those feel good programs, right? So it, it um, I, so I had this pot of money and I was working with the State Department and you know, everybody's happy, right? Like, uh, you know, we did a thing in Belize, for example, they're happy, we're happy, the treasury secretary loves it, he gets to, you know, sign this thing, you know, it's like, it's, it's good. And the other thing that was interesting is that was part of the, the debt office. And this was um, in 2000. And this was during the um, global HIPAA highly indebted poor countries initiative, where the Western led led really by the UK, but the US was in lockstep to forgive developing country debt in this kind of jubilee, turn of the century, jubilee 2000, which is a, a kind of a debt relief and forgiveness. And we forgave a lot of uh, developing country debt to kind of get them on their right footing again. And that was fun. It was really heady times. And, and the treasury department kind of with like Larry Summers 
at the helm, and then Tim Geithner there, David Lipton. These were really real governor, government heavyweights, and um, the Treasury Department ruled during that period, right? During sort of the eight years of the Clinton, it was really uh, a Treasury Department led kind of uh, place. So it was very fun to be there. And, you know, still some of my closest friends I met there, honestly. Wow. As a younger economist, it was a, it was a great place to be. Uh, you know. Very nice, nice. And, and you know, I, I think I've heard you speak to this, Stacey. Like, so some of these experience with some of these countries, uh, you know, the global market development. Um, I'm sure some of this did color, you know, how you viewed crypto. And, and you know, I always like asking um, guests when they first come on, what were their like first initial reactions? Was was crypto something that made sense to you right away, or did it take a little bit while for you to come around to it? Yeah, I, you know, um, I'll, maybe I'll answer the, the immediate question first because mm-hmm. it's kind of a funny story and then I'll give, maybe I'll back up and give you a little TradFi context for it. But I was, I had just joined the Milken Institute. Um, I was with JP Morgan in London after New York. And so I was six years in London and I just kind of wanted to come home. And so I had just started uh, with the Milken Institute and um, I was, I started this partnership with the National Institute for the Press to, and I apologize to you in advance because I failed miserably at this. I was trying to improve the level of financial education of the press, you know, and um, so that we would have just more thoughtful, more thoughtful reporting. And I thought, okay, well, you know, I will do this partnership and we will do like basic financial markets education. And, you know, there, there was a lot going on in, in particular, like housing finance reform, right? So the whole, the whole um, crisis with the with the uh, GSEs and what was going to happen. We were coming out of the global financial crisis, right? So there's a lot of issues. They're very complicated. And I was just hoping to kind of dig in on some of these issues. And the woman there said, you know what? This is in 2013. She said, what is Bitcoin? I w- I'm requesting that you give a talk on to the local, to, the, to all the correspondents and this press that comes to the National Institute of the Press. I, I'm requesting that you give a talk on Bitcoin. And so that's a little bit different than starting to dabble in Bitcoin by yourself. Like my first, my first introduction to it was that I had to lecture on it. So I, I had to be very smart kind of very quickly, right? And so I, you know, basically I was, my, my house was undergoing renovation at the time. So I was living in this like kind of crappy ass one bedroom condo while they were like tearing apart my kitchen, this house that I just bought. And I locked myself in there basically for five days. And I was, and then you're, you don't, I didn't understand anything. And, you know, it was very also technical in terms of like technology too, right? Yeah. I'm listening to podcasts in Germany and, you know, all of this stuff. Gavin Andreessen, you know, I finally remember I came across this podcast with Gavin Andreessen. It was so clear. And I was like, okay. And then I emerged, you know, like five days later in love with this thing. Like I couldn't believe the potential for it. I mean, I, and I, and I wanted to understand how the proof of work worked and so I made sure that I did that. And then on the back of this, you know, try, for myself trying to get smart, everything was very high level. And a lot of it was kind of histrionic in various different ways or, and talked about what it could do. And then there was a bit that was technical. And I wanted to write something in the middle that, that, that addressed people like me that actually wanted to know, like, what's a non? How does this proof of work work? What is this consensus mechanism? How does it actually, like, how does, you know, what's the, what's the kernel of, of how this works? And so, I wrote this, this article and this article was downloaded like a gazillion times from the Milken Institute. And that's when I started thinking, okay, there's really maybe something to this. And it kind of just uh, took off from there, but no, I would, I think I'm kind of legitimately a love at first sight um, type. Yeah. Yeah. For, for Bitcoin. Yeah. And it was not exactly a fit for purpose of what I thought it could do. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't exactly do what I thought it could do, but then, you know, then this like 25 year old kid comes along and he's talking about programmable money Right. And I, was, I mean, the whole thing is just like, you can't, you can't go back. Right. Once you're exposed to the potential, you can't, you can't go back. That's why I, I believe, you know, in a crypto during the crypto winter, like it's just, it's just no going back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of people who, um, and, and what's the word you, in a, a, a trade fi, is that traditional? Uh, trad fi, traditional finance. Yeah, traditional finance. Yeah, I just want to make yeah. sure I was getting it right. Yeah, yeah and yeah. so yeah, I wanted to make that clear for the listeners. You know, because a yeah. lot of people that come from that background, that uh, trad five background, um, I guess it depends on the person. But you have some people who are resistant. Uh, what about maybe like some of your colleagues or friends, family? What did did any of them like push back or like Stacy? What 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 are you talking about? Did you get any any of that? 
there are a lot, you know, there's quite a few of them that are saying, oh gosh, we wish we bought Bitcoin when you told us to. I mean, you know, that's, sure. a, that's a lot of people right now, yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, or, uh, but I think, you, you know, I was always doing it as a side hustle at the Milken Institute. So I was running big, raising money for big programs, running big programs. And I had this life in developing countries where I was helping build developing country capital markets. At the same time, I had this kind of crypto side, a side hustle. And it, I, it couldn't help occurring to me that this could probably be a good solution for this over here, right? That at a more of a macro context as well, there were problems with financial inclusion, problems with capital markets that don't function properly problems with access to capital for, for, for entrepreneurs. You know, again, this comes from the NASDAQ and it's just all kind of builds where I thought, okay, you know, I'm, I don't want to be sort of Pollyannish about this. It's not like a panacea for everything, but that there are elements of this new way of thinking that are, are going to be very applicable for. And so I was a little bit of an evangelist and, and at the Milken, and so Mike Milken, this is a good, you know, Mike Milken does not want something to go wrong. Like he's a bit risk averse because of, you know, the headlines, Mike Milken, you know, junk bond mm. king, you know, yeah. a million people lose money in Bitcoin, you know, like he does Oof. not, he's, yeah. he does not want yeah. that, right? So he's a little, he was a bit skeptical, but this article was downloaded a lot. And then we had in 2014, we had a panel um, and that was the most downloaded. And I was fighting for a room. I wanted a big room. No, 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 you can't have a big room and blah, 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 blah. You know, it was early. Like I had like Brock Pierce and Gavin Andres on this panel kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. And this panel is the most downloaded panel of the 2014 Milken Institute Global Conference, right? Oh, so wow. I knew, I just kept knowing there's something here, there's something here. And, you know, of course. Yeah. Wow. So it's yeah, incredible. It so stacy has been around the, uh, the space for a long time, for sure. That, that's yeah. awesome. So, yeah. so, I'm so, not so, an OG or anything like that, but I, but I, <laughs> I feel like I've been a good observer of it. For, uh, for yeah, I would absolutely say so. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So Stacey, um, why Algorand? Um, what, what's, I guess we'll start with this. Well, what are, what are some of the advantages you see in Algorand compared to some of the other layer ones out there? You know, I think um, the way, the way I, I, I think about this is maybe if you, if you wouldn't mind, I'll frame it a little bit in like what, what blockchain and crypto technology can sure. do kind of for the world, right? And this is, I think, also the way that Silvio McCauley, our founder, um, also kind of viewed it. It's like, you know, there's 1.7 billion people in this world without access to uh, financial markets without access. And, you know, that's typically thought of as having access to a bank account, right? Mm -hmm. um, 1.7 billion people, that's a lot of people, right? And imagine living your life where you can't get easy access to credit. You can't, you're, you're burying, you know, cash in your, in your mattress, right? Or you're worried mm -hmm. that, you know, your, your cousin, if they come over, they're going to take your money, like stuff like that, right? Um, One billion of those people has access to a mobile phone though, right? And so, how are we going to kind of solve this problem? And then in developing countries in particular, but not just in developing countries, by the way, you, when, you deposit, when, you, when you try to save in a bank, even those that have access, you earn, let's just say, 3% on your savings account, and the inflation in the country is like 7%. So just by holding your money there, you're losing 4% every year, right? You're losing money by saving it. At the same time, all of these entrepreneurs over here don't, aren't getting access to capital that they need. And so you've got to get this growth for me and prosperity is getting this virtuous circle going where, where, where savers can, can give their savings to, through investment, through well-functioning capital markets, can, can channel their, their, you know, the way that JJ's done all his life, right? Channel his money towards companies that are, that are trying to get money to, to grow, right? And then you grow, you hire more people, you pay them more, and people have more savings and the thing like goes like that, right? And, and so a little bit of the North Star for me is, You know, how do you get that right? How do you get this access to capital? How do you get these, this, this financial inclusion? And if you're going to do that, the blockchain has a lot of potential, right? It's not that, you know, the last 20 years of banking improvements in banking have been that there's these bank balance sheets and the messaging between them gets faster and faster. Like you guys remember, we went from T plus three to T plus two, like how proud everybody was of themselves, 2015, right? 2015, exactly. Yeah. yeah, right. It's just like took two years to do. And, you know, I mean, and that yeah, was a big deal. It was a really big deal. And, 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 but a blockchain is different. It's not two balance sheets. It's everybody writing to one ledger, you know? Exactly. It's like one ledger. It's revolutionary. And, mm -hmm. and on top of that, you can have programmable money, you know, if then statements, right? And then yeah. you can have very, very minute savings vehicles, very, very minute trades. And, and, and so that, that promise means scale. 
And you cannot deliver on that promise if you do 14 transactions per second, you cannot, right? So the only way to deliver on something, the thing that I care about is your layer one, your blockchain is kind of you call the layer one, mm -hmm. has to be able to be compete with traditional finance rails. It has to have the transactions per second, right? And so Algorand, um, again, you know, famously invented by one of the most famous cryptographers in the world, this you know, tenured professor at MIT, Sylvia McCauley, won the Turing Award. Um, he, the Algorand started doing a thousand transactions per second, right? So, so you know, Ethereum is like 18 transactions per second, right? Um, and the other thing is, you know, this T plus two, that's a, by the way, dear audience, that's a settlement. So that's when you, when you do your trade, <laughs> When the money settles, it used to be three days later, and that's two days later, et cetera. Or think about, you know, when you wire money to somebody, it's like 10 days later, or maybe seven exactly. days later, if it's, if it's international, right? Trades on Algorand, they settle in 4.5 seconds. And that's Algorand is not. It's just unbelievable. It and is. it's going down. It's yeah. almost, and, and they're, they're squeezing that to 2.5 seconds, but then wow. it bumps up against physics, actually. You kind of can't get any faster okay. than that just for... For physics, very interesting actually. Why? Okay. Why it's hard to get it faster than that? Two point five seconds, no forking, final settlement, right? So if wow. you think about it, always in these big picture terms, how can I onboard all of these, you know, millions of people? By the way, this summer we're moving to six thousand transactions per second. By the end of the year, we'll be at ten thousand transactions per second. And at four point five second finality, what else do you need? Like if you're going to deliver on this promise, what else do you need? Well, you can't pay a lot in gas fees, right? You can't bring in these small payment kinds of um, uh, members of the global economy if you have large gas fees. So Algorand, uh, the, the transaction fees on Algorand are 0 0.001 ALGA. So they're sub penny transaction fees. They're not uh -huh. even noticeable uh -huh. actually. And then if you're gonna do all of that, you're gonna, and you have a very successful layer one, what else can't you have? Well, you can't be, um, you know, you gotta be nice to mother nature, right? You know, don't mess with mother nature as they, as they, as they say, right? So you have to have a very, light carbon footprint and we have a we we use the energy of about seven houses and we buy through smart contract um enough energy um carbon offsets to make sure that we're always uh carbon negative so we run a carbon negative blockchain you know six thousand transactions per second 4.5 second final settlement sub penny transaction fees i mean gentlemen what is not to like about that no kidding wow. you know Incredible. never been down for a second since it went live not we just had our our, I think, 20 millionth, 24, 21st millionth block. We've never been down for one second. Really? Not one second since we went live. Wow. Now, I think I'm a little bit, you know, tempting fate every time I say that. I don't want to, <laughs> <laughs> I want to you know, I don't want to, but yeah, never, yeah. we've never been down for a second. I mean, that, it's that, that's just thing. amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, my my specialty as well. I, I was one of those traders. I, I specialized in cross border settlement and things like that. And right. and and back in Vancouver in the in the nineties, we had thirteen day settlement. That's how right. messed up it was, right? You know, to, to think of of something settling in four seconds, right. it that's right. actually just like mind blowing. You right. know, for someone who's been around for thirty years like myself, it's just. Right. You know, and no I, forking. I mean, you know, there's yeah. all stable coins like growing. Imagine having a stable coin on a, on a layer one that could fork even for a couple of seconds. Mm -hmm. And then both both sides of that fork are redeemable for a buck. Like you you cannot be in that world even for a second, right? That's true. And so yeah. you give you get a lot of it's it's very it's a very you get a lot of comfort, I think, from a from a chain that will settle so quickly and that will you know will never fork. Yeah, that, that's you pretty know, amazing. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think too that the first thing that caught my eye about Algorand, you know, a couple of years ago was mm. uh, just the founder, right? It just such an impressive resume. Do you mind, Stacey, maybe just just briefly for you know for the listeners who don't know who he is, uh, just you know, run down on him. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So he invented a couple of things that are fundamental to cryptocurrency, and he didn't do it in a cryptocurrency sphere. He did it right. in a cryptography sphere, and those two things are zero knowledge proofs and um, verified random functions. And so everybody started, and the, there's many things that make Satoshi Nakamoto a genius, but one of the things about it was that everything about the cryptography and the public private keys and all that was sort of invented already in the 90s. What was new and innovative, what innovative was kind of this idea of attaching money to core cryptography. And so that's what he was able to do. And, and the piece that was not solved was this double payments problem. How do you, how do you make sure that you know, if you have $10 in your account, you can't, I can't give Ray $10 and JJ $10 because Chase Bank will say, look, you know, you only have $10 in that block. How do you 
with a bunch of computers that are disparate all over the place. They don't talk to each other and maybe some of them are not, are not um, uh, good actors. How do you make sure that that $10 can't be spent twice? This is like the major thing that Satoshi Nakamoto kind of broke through and he did it through this proof of work consensus mechanism. And Silvio, I think, watched this evolve for a number of years, right? And they're using his core technology that he has, you know, won very, I mean, everybody talks about the Turing Award winning because at from Alan Turing, mm-hmm. he's won, you know, I, you know, my arm's length worth of, of other awards as well. And he's, he's, you know, at the height of his field, he's, you know, sitting in his perch at, at MIT. And he says to himself, I, I picture him on a, a bright sunny day walking down, you know, the Charles River, you know, I could probably build a better one of those, you know, I, I, cause he had a little bit of second mover advantage, right? You know, he saw the proof of work, which was uh, very decentralized, but also very slow and had a very large carbon footprint, right? Then there were evolutions, right? To a proof of stake, a delegated proof of stake or a bonded proof of stake. Those have um, um, good, um, uh, good things about them in terms of they're, they're much faster, right? Um, sometimes you sacrifice, you kind of always sacrifice uh, decentralization. So they're very centralized. And there's a couple of problems with them, right? Like, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a proof of stake, the idea is, is good, right? You, the more you give to the blockchain, the more you should be rewarded, kind of is the idea. But then the rich get richer. That's a, that's a big problem with it, right? The rich get richer. And also, they're very vulnerable to attack. It's like, who are you going to attack? Oh, that guy over there with the big stake, you know, because he's the one that's pending the blocks of the blockchain. Like, it's just inherently not secure. And Vitalik Buterin, um, you know, had this kind of famous um, challenge, which was to say that, you know, a blockchain cannot be at the same time decentralized and scalable and secure. And I picture Sylvia walking down the Charles River and saying, you know, I think that's probably wrong. I think you probably can have all three of those things. It appealed to him mm-hmm. in his, you know, cryptography mind and how are you going to work through this problem? And so, uh, so he, uh, you know, because of his name and because he knew, you know, crypto, he could put a cryptography team together and a computer science team together right away. He was immediately able to raise a bunch of money. So they never did like an ICO or something like that and um, built this thing from like 2017 to 2019 and went live in June. We've just had our, our third anniversary, as I said, went live in 2017. And the idea was that he could achieve all three of those things. It's called the, the trilemma. He was able to with this, um, with uh, Algorand to do, to achieve all three of those things. Cause it's a very elegant consensus mechanism. And the juice in blockchain is how, is the consensus mechanism that you have? How do you get those computers to agree on the order of transactions that they all agree that what is the state of the affairs is the state of affairs. Mm-hmm. So, so Stacy, uh, what applications, uh, some popular applications we got on Algorand and what are some of the things you're, you're excited about? Well, you know, we are having a kind of a Cambrian explosion of DeFi applications on, on Algorand right now. So we are really, they are just coming fast and furious, everything from borrow lend platforms, money, money, uh, money market platforms, decentralized exchanges, um, all of that is really, it's really starting to, um, you know, we used to have three or four, now we've got, you know, tens and 20 and coming, you know, coming on testnet onto mainnet. We're also seeing a lot of activity in our creative space. So these are NFTs, both yep. in art and in music and some very high end artists, really interesting plays in music as well. So the song that owns itself. So how can you tokenize songs and invest in an actual song? Um, very interesting real estate tokenization of real estate plays um, coming on chain. And then a lot of um, also kind of real world uh, examples. And, you know, just to say one thing about the, the creative economy, because it's just like going like gangbusters now. Mm. Um, we, part of why we attract those, 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 those types is because the transaction fees are so low, right? Because yeah. if you're trying to sell an NFT, sometimes that price of that NFT might not be that high. You can't famously, as you know, what happened sort of with the apes uh, most recently, you can't pay gas prices that are worth more and then maybe pay gas prices and not even get your NFT, right? So, and then they care very much about carbon footprint as it turns out, right? Like, so you, you, if you're an artist type, you tend to maybe love mother nature a bit, you know, you're a bit more inclined that way. So they're, they're very exacting about that. So we have all of that going on. And then um, in kind of more, 
uh, I hate to use this expression, but people do like kind of real world kind of applications or just more out there IRL kind of applications is yep. um, we have a number of very interesting uh, partnerships. One, a couple of the uh, sort of, you know, interesting like archetypal kind of examples I could give you is one is with Napster. So we have a very deep partnership with Napster. Those of you, do, you, you know what Napster is, right? So mm, yeah, um, oh yeah. they have, <laughs> and you know, Napster was a really a quintessential, really early web two company, right? Yeah, yeah. And they now want to reimagine and transform themselves into an organization where artists are going to see, uh, see the value of the art that they create, musicians in this case, right? And that listeners um, are going to be able to monetarily reward the the creators that they listen to this is very um very web free kind of out, and we're just and this i love it we're super yeah super happy to be a part of that um another um kind of example is in payments right and so this is what i sort of started with the importance of cheap payments and everything about finance i think honestly comes down to the quality of your payment system and i'll just give you one example we're working with a number of disaster relief organizations uh, in the United States to do uh, to make payments on on Algorand. Now, what is why is this important, right? Like your house is flooded. You're in Texas. Your house is flooded. You need you need you know, you need to get furniture. You just like you're 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 the worst possible thing has happened to you and you need money now. And then from the donor or the government, the FEMA side, they there's all kinds of um, opportunity for fraud. Right. So I could be a, a you know, um, trying to get money from FEMA Texas and also from FEMA um, regular, it's government money. I, you know, you've got to be very, very careful. So you got on the one hand, people that need to be very careful. On the other hand, people that are desperate and it just is not working very well for anybody right now. And so what a blockchain enables you to do is to, you know, take a picture of your living room, establish your identity and the money is there in your pocket. So it reduces fraud and it also makes funds payable when you really, really need it. And, um, you know, I mean, there are stories, and I won't name any names, but there are stories now of, of disaster relief organizations that get on a plane to say, just say Texas, for example, mm -hmm. with tens of thousands of prepaid money cards mm -hmm. on them, like in a suitcase. So they wow. fly and they start handing out these prepaid money cards. I mean, it's just like no way to do things. And so to we're, we're partnering with um, a, a really a cool wallet provider named AidTech and a bunch of uh, disaster relief organizations. Uh, two in particular, one is the National Association of Disaster Relief Organizations, one is St. Vincent de Paul, to be their layer one blockchain to roll out disaster relief um, payments in this country. And then we have lots of conversations going on globally with this, as, as you can imagine, just because again, the core fundamentals, it's like speed, very low cost and able to handle enormous transaction throughput. So yeah, it's kind of, it's exciting stuff. You can really imagine making the world a better place, you know? It's, it's incredible. There's just so many use cases for blockchain. And, and I remember, uh, you know, for myself, when I first started learning about things and I'm like, yeah. like, this just could really, you could just, blockchain is just so applicable and makes so much sense. Like it makes a, a lot of the, you know, stuff in place seem very archaic, you know, uh, it really does. And, you know, just to the, the point you brought up with the, uh, the NFTs, cause I'm, I'm, I'm very much into NFTs, um, Stacy and, um, you know how many times I went to go sell on NFTs and I saw the gas fees and I'm like, it don't even, it doesn't even make sense for me to sell. It doesn't even make sense for me to sell. So like, that's when it was like, for me, like being someone who's actually, you know, in there, like using it, it may, it's like, it's, this is ridiculous um, with the fees. So I think that's a, that's a huge thing you spoke to too. And then just, just on the music bit, um, you know, JJ, when we had on, um, I think it was a couple of uh, podcasts uh, back, we had on a poker player, anybody's he's very heavy into NFTs and mm -hmm. he was, he was speaking to the music part. And I thought the music NFTs, uh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, and even from the aspect, like, it's like, you can bet on an artist. Like if, like, say I got one of the art, uh, artists is like early songs before he got really big. That's it's almost cool. like, it's almost like a bet on the artist. I thought that yes. that was a really unique, um, interesting perspective. And, and I like the NFTs that have like. You know, I mean, I'm into the art and I think the art is really cool too, but I think like other applications of the technology, I think make a lot of sense, like gaming or, or the music in this case as well. I'm, I'm real interested in those. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm very interested in the music part of it because I mean, what if you could like get a slice of Wu-Tang before, you know, they blew up? You know? Exactly. I mean, yeah, exactly. Right. Or you, you know, just imagine you go into to see a concert and say it's more of like, you know, an indie band. I mean, I don't know if this mm -hmm. exactly worked with Taylor Swift, say, but you know, it's, uh, you know, not maybe as well. And you walk in and the guy, 
you know, you know, looks at your NFT and he sees how many times you've listened to this artist. Like it's right there. And he says, Hey, you know, you want to come backstage and, and meet them? I see that you've been, you've had this album on like every day for, you know, the last year you probably do you want, and it's like, what, you know, exactly. or here's some more tickets or let's upgrade your seats or whatever. It establishes, it's, it monetizes community and it rewards community. Right. Um, mm. Or another interesting thing that they're um, toying with a little bit at Napster is that you might, find a way to be rewarded for trying different music, right? That yeah. you wouldn't necessarily, so that there's a way to just incentivize kind of curiosity, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. Or I a was, restaurant, you know? Yeah. Like, why do you, why are they first come for serve reservations? Why don't you, and why could there be maybe a secondary market for reservations? Like you're not the most loyal customer. The most loyal customer gets the best table on, yeah. you know, January 15th, but you could say, hey, but it's our anniversary. Can I, can I buy your exactly. reservation from you? Yeah. It's an important day to me. And I want that yeah. table. Like all of this stuff is like so exciting, right? It is. I mean, I was, I was at a music festival in, in uh, Leon C in, in, I, I'm in England now. And there was this band that just blew me away at these young guys. And, you know, I was just thinking about this and, and putting that together. Like if those guys could actually, you know, get notoriety. And I mean, and I looked on, you know, they've got like one song on SoundCloud and that's it. Right. You know, and they, they could be so much, you know, there could be so much more, you know, or it's you could, you could, you could, you know, fund them for yeah. a portion of future revenues, right? Like exactly. in a way that they might be much more interested in than, than the yeah. typical. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 And like you said, Stacey, it truly is exciting. Uh, just, you know, so many uh, possibilities uh, that could come from this. It's, it's going to be very fun watching it all develop. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, compared to, I guess, like uh, TradFi, Stacy, what are maybe some of like the unique challenges that you face um, in crypto? You know, when you look at this, uh, and I think, you know, maybe, you know, you and JJ will probably back me up on this a little bit, but, um, you know, when you look at this crypto winter that we're going through right now, I mean, the villains are all the same, right? It's like, it's oh. leverage and rehypothecation, honestly, right? Oh, like, gosh, there's no just, kidding. There's nothing new going on right here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It's just <laughs> happening very fast. And to people that have not maybe been around the block as many times as we have, right? Mm-hmm. Um, um, but, I, but I think there's um, a general, um, um, not confidence, what's the word I want? Uh, like a tug of war between rule-based frameworks and discretion frameworks. Mm-hmm. So I saw this very up close and, and, and crypto tends to be rule-based, right? It's written into code, that's the idea, right? So it will always have this problem of when do you want to override code to make a decision that code is not and that I think is a harder thing and this this you're seeing this with um, margin calls right so sometimes some of these protocols are not wanting the the smart contract version of the margin call to kick in because it could be very bad for the overall ecosystem this is not a problem Uh, in TradFi right and the problem in TradFi is you call the guy up and you say look, you know, and he's like, look, I need a couple more days. And you <laughs> either give it to him or you don't, but you've got yeah. that discretion and nobody kind of cares, right? Yes, yeah. These are the kinds of, you know, my in global financial crisis, we had problems where, you know, there was automatic selling if you drop out of the, you know, the yeah. Fortune 500 or all of these things, like big institutional investors had rules around that. And people lost a lot of money because if they just kind of hung on and been able to ride it out, override those rules, but you don't want too much discretion, right? So this is a very, exactly. you know, it's a very otherwise we get movie. another Archegos, right? Right. Exactly. Oh my God. I mean, and that's the thing when people say, oh, you know, crypto, it's, it's, it's unlicensed. I mean, look at Archegos, what that guy got away with at, in a completely licensed environment. Right. You know, right. it's like he, he went to, you know, 10 different bookies who didn't know that they were, you know, loading him money. It was just. Right. Right. You know, and then, and you know, the, the stuff that's blown up so far really has been pretty much more CFI than, than, than DeFi, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I guess on like the, the, the regulation front, Stacey, how do you, I know it can maybe be like a complex ish question or, you know, people have different opinions. Well, where do, where do you stand? I I guess on, um, I guess, regulation in crypto markets. You know, I, I think we, you know, and, and I am not, of course, the only one to say this, but just regulatory clarity would mm-hmm. make things better for everybody. But I am deeply sympathetic to, to the regulators and how they think about this thing. It's just different than anything else that's come along, right? Is it money? 
Is it a security? Is it a commodity? Well, yeah, it's a little bit of everything in a way, right? And so how do you, how do you think about it? I mean, more broadly, right? Um, and they are taking their time and, um, but it's, I don't, I don't, I don't envy, I don't envy the regulators, but I think they, we do need a little bit of clarity so people, you know, kind of understand, you know, how to, how to behave in this environment. I think, um, but letting, you know, a couple of interesting examples, back in the Clinton um, administration, when um, eBay first went live, this was a very, this was like crypto. So people are going to mm -hmm. have like online buying and selling, like, what is that? How should that be? And they made the decision to just let it roll for a little bit and see, and that it would kind of figure out, they'd kind of figure out what it, what it was, right? And I, that was turned out to be a very good decision for the dot-com market in broadly. Same thing in Kenya, right? So M-Pace is a very famous, very early example of digital money, right? So digital money kind of started in Africa, actually. Wow. And in Kenya and M-Pesa, but that was something that came from the telcos, not the central bank. So they weren't regulated initially by the central bank. So they had a little bit of runway to get going and to see if it could work. Right? And it was transformational for the people of that country and really for the world led by, led by Kenya. And so I think I, I applaud the regulators for just trying to see you know, how it develops a little bit. But at some point you need to, you know, we're going to, I think everybody will benefit from just good um, sensible um, regula regulatory clarity in the, in the area, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, Stacey, I appreciate um, the conversations. I'm going to let you go soon. Uh, I want to, yeah, can I ask you, yeah, yeah was, sure. was this, was, was I better than Anthony Scaramucci, would you say, or I mean, how do you, how would you, how did you, how would you compare? I, I, I think, topic? I think you stayed on topic and like more concise than, uh, than <laughs> <Yeah>. Anthony. <laughs> But low, you, you didn't have any, you didn't have any bar maybe, but okay. But you didn't have any crazy uncle stories where they sent you to Harlem to get a motorcycle. You know? <laughs> right. That's, that, that was... <laughs> right. Right. That's too bad. Cause I do actually have one crazy uncle, but I, uh, but yeah, I didn't bring him up. <laughs> Next time. Next time. Definitely. Definitely. Next time. Uh, yeah. B big shout out to uh, Scaramucci. Big shout yeah, out. But yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I it, it was awesome. I appreciate everything you said. Um, but before you get out, I, I like to do like some rapid fire, maybe some like miscellaneous type of questions. Okay. Um, so when you're away from work, Stacy, what, what are some of your hobbies? Okay, there's no greater delta than the difference between my interest in tennis and my actual tennis game. So <laughs> I spend a lot of time without a lot to show for it. I would say trying to become a better tennis player. Um, yeah, so that's and I'm I, I love tennis. I love it despite the fact that I I have a couple of friends. I still, I never beat them. I mean, I never ever beat these guys. And I'm in better shape than they are too. But there's just a tennis sense that I'm I'm really working on. I love uh, I love hiking. I'm a I'm a good hiker. And I like biking um, a lot. Mm -hmm. So I've I've done these for a climate ride. And we are actually now Algorand is supporting climate rides. So they do these bike okay. rides for for climate challenges. And I've done with them a number like from Bar Harbor, Maine to Boston. I did. And down through Death Valley, I did with them. So mm -hmm. I like uh, I like a lot of uh, biking. I'm trying to learn how to play bridge, not just because I'm getting old and older women <laughs> play bridge, not, but because my bro my my brother is a lifetime master bridge player, oh, uh, life master, yeah, like a life master. And then yeah, and so I've always sort of wanted to play, and I've started and not started a couple of times. Um, I have two golden doodles. Um, okay. And I like to spend time with with them. Uh, Skyler and Wilhelmina. Skyler is named after the Skyler sisters, and Wilhelmina is named after the Williams sisters. Um, so, okay. yeah. there you go. There yeah. you go. It's funny. The the last podcast we had, Stacy, we um uh, the guy's a uh, sports better gambler of sorts, and he uh, he made a he did a prop bet with a professional tennis player where the professional tennis player used a frying pan. Uh, and he had to be the, the guy still, the professional still won with the frying pan. Oh, right. Yeah. That's uh, amazing. I, I just, yeah. it's just, it's just incredible how, like when you're so proficient at something where you're so good. Yeah. 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 Is, is tennis has been something you've always had a passion for? You know, I, in, in life as an adult. And I think if you don't, and I didn't play hand eye sports, um, when I was a kid growing up. And so like, I'm athletic, but I, I don't have this deep kind of hand eye court. I don't have deep ball sense. Mm -hmm. And um, it's funny how hard it's been for me to get better than, you know, like a three, if you're a 3.0 player, you want to be a 3.5 player. 
And so I'm a solid 3.0 player, but to become a good 3.5, it's like an ocean. Of, it's, a, it's an ocean away for me. Mm -hmm. It's funny. I think it's good for like personal growth, right? Like doing stuff that maybe we're not like naturally inclined towards, you know, like the yeah. frustration, the losing, I think, you know, it's, right. I think it helps build, you know. Um, I have so much character from tennis. Yeah. It's building character. I have like so much. And then swimming too. I, I also like, I'm not afraid of the water and I'm buoyant, you know, but I, I never swam like to get from point A to point B as a child. It was just not really a part of my, and so, you know, trying to learn how to swim as an adult and like, I can swim, but not like, you know to as a form of exerciser to get places and yeah you know i was taking swing lessons the other like two years ago i'm in there with like eight-year-olds in this pool and, you know <laughs> i mean it's good for your humility definitely yeah i, I just wait in the pool i'm not swimming i'm not doing yeah. that i'm just <laughs> just gonna i'm just gonna tan that's it <laughs> so, uh, so, just so looking stacy, good looking yeah, good for the ladies yeah. trying to trying to at least <laughs> yeah so uh, uh stacy I, I don't know if uh, if you're a reader or not but could, could you recommend me a good book maybe that you've read lately oh let's see a good book i've read lately gosh i've read um wow what book have i um lately well, I'll t I can tell you some in of general. my, yeah, yeah, some of my, some of my, a, a, a book I read last year that I really like is called City of Thieves. Okay. Um, that is a, a fiction book by the guy that did a lot of the screenplays for, um, for, uh, what was that? Uh, that super popular TV show that was um, seven, everybody's watching. I didn't watch it, but everybody watched Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. David Benioff. This I loved it. Really mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Really, really good book. City of Thieves. And then A Gentleman in Moscow was also a, a book that I read recently that I thought was just kind of perfect. Um, and then uh, nonfiction books, I've read um, A Short History of Everything, I thought was also a very good book, just about hmm. the history of science, basically, from the beginning of time to now. Very readable, really super fun book. Um, a, um, another good fiction book I liked was I uh, called Donkey King Kong that uh, just great took, takes place in Queens really great great okay. book um, yeah I've been reading a lot of crypto books and blockchain books this year though just to make sure that I'm really yeah um, sure you want know. you want to just throw some out there for the audience yeah there's a, a good book I thought that was kind of a, 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 a book by Nick Batia called later layered money that I thought was really very thought provoking about how how, how to think about money uh, more broadly, um, which I which I would recommend it. Maybe not everybody's read, but I would re I would recommend. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Stacy, if you had to choose a last meal, what would it be? Spanakopita from my grandmother, definitely with tirapitas from my grandmother. So I'm half Greek. Okay. Um, so okay. the spinach pie, yeah, Greek tirapitas, spanakopita, maybe a side of salmon or halibut. Yeah. 100% <laughs> roasted potatoes, mm, dark yes. chocolate, something yeah. afterwards. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. Um, yeah. No, no, no. I was going to ask you. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, ask me. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I always ask this question. I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, you know what? It's probably a boring answer, but uh, I would probably just go like an omelet. Uh, I'd probably just like uh -huh. cheese in there and some tomatoes or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe some. Oh, man, I know that's such a boring answer. I hate I hate myself for saying that. I would have to think a little bit longer. Maybe um, you know, I'm podcast, Italian. You know, you can cut this part. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, you know what? I'm so bad at editing, though. I'd have to. It would take me forever. I'm too lazy. Um, or what about books? Have you guys read anything I should read? I um, uh, man, it, it's a long book. I'm still going through it. I got. I, they recommended it to me. It was a book written in the '50s. Um, uh, Atlas shrugged, but this. Oh, really? Bad read. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm struggling to get through it. It's just so, I mean, she's a phenomenal writer. Um, uh, Aaron. I read Rand. it a long time ago, actually. I read that book a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. How long did it take you, Stacey? I, it's, this thing is, this, it's like a thousand pages. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like it was, uh, yeah, it was a bit of a slog, as I recall. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I'm reading currently. I've, I've read a bunch of books re recently. But life's I'm, too short. You know, I always say if you get to a hundred pages you got to finish it but you can bail within the first 100 pages that's no true. harm no foul that's your okay so you got a 100 100 page roll okay 100, 150 yeah something yeah. like that yeah. okay yeah, i like that I, I like that i'm still working through followers inside life and wall street that's uh oh yeah that's, and, that's a classic i mean 1873 yeah, just just right. amazing yeah and who's the who's the well, the other one that's a classic about the stock market operator jimmy a confessions of a stock market Oh, oh, JJ yeah, loves this. Yeah. You love that one, JJ. Yeah, yeah that's a yeah. great book. 
Yeah, that's a great yeah. book. That guy was so yeah, so smart. Yeah, yeah. I um I, I didn't read it recently, but I, I I saw him pop up today. Um, I don't know if Stacey, if you are aware of Ed Thorpe. He was mm -hmm. um he was an MIT professor too a while ago. Uh -huh. Um, but he was the first one to come up with card counting. Um, and then he oh. went on to be like one of the first like quant, uh, quant hedge funds. Oh, I read his biography and, um, just, oh, yeah, he's just an incredible awesome. human. Yeah. Just an incredible person achievements. And I, I seen him, he, he popped up on a podcast recently and I've been trying to reach out to him. I can't get in touch with him, but like, so I don't know if someone's out there, get me in touch with Ed Thorpe. He's like, uh, love this guy. Have you, um, have you played bridge by the way? I mean, does, is there a transferable skill set there? You know, I haven't played bridge, man. God, my, I know my grandmother played it like twice a week. Um, it, it I was not play, easy. I bet yeah. you'd be good. I bet you would be very, and I bet you'd be very good actually. Yeah. I mean, I think so. I, I, you know, I, I played professional poker. Um, so I love, mm -hmm. I love card games. I always grew up playing those things, but, um, get bridge. I don't know too much about yeah, but it's the same. There's a there's a bedrock idea of like kind of knowing where you are in the deck and what's been played and what hasn't uh, and just like mm -hmm. the shape of things. And I don't know. I, I I'm not sure. That makes sense. Sure or not, but I think you'd have a pretty serious leg up as a poker player. Yeah, well, they, they, there's one, you know, because there's different um, variants of poker, right? So you have like different games within just like the poker uh, genre. And there, yeah. there's one game, seven card stud where um there are some face-up cards that no, no, normal poker is uh, or Texas Hold'em the most commonly played. You don't see other cards, but there's a variant where there's more face-up cards and keeping track of the cards is uh -huh. like one of the important skills because card removal is a big factor, right? Because we know how many cards are in the deck. There's a fixed amount of cards. And so it changes the odds in certain scenarios. So being able to keep up with it, probably um, the, the guy you mentioned earlier in the podcast who could crunch uh, the, the bonds in his head. Yeah, I would yeah. be good at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I guess, um, last thing here, um, I, I, I'm sure you probably have a bunch of um nuggets of wisdom you've gained along the way. But is there anything you maybe want to like leave the listeners with, um, before you get out of here? Um, I would say, um, <clears throat> cultivate a reputation for not saying things when you don't know what you're talking about. Mm. Um, and so it's better to say, I don't know, I have no idea, than to kind of try to make it up at the edge, mm. I would say. Yeah, because then people, because you want people to be like, oh yeah, okay, Stacy said it, so I'm good. As yeah. opposed to Stacy said it, and mostly she's right, but sometimes she talks out of her ass and you know, so I'm not 100% <laughs> sure, you know? And so I, this has just come up a couple of times for me recently and, it's a little bit on my mind. Yeah, just like, just try to be, I mean, it's a cliche, but try to be, try to, you know, you try, try to be true to your word or have your word, you know, have people be like, okay, yeah, yeah. That's solid when that person says it. I think that's a really good quality in, in people. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, and I think, um, you know, I think even JJ that can, um, you know, circle back to trading too, like a, mm -hmm. as traders, like the people who are like, have like the strongest convictions or, yeah. you know, things like that. You, you know, you gotta be open to like, Hey, I might be wrong here. Right. Yep. Yep. You know, yep. like I might be wrong. Like I'm not going to like just double down. And right. <laughs> that's a very good example of what I'm talking about. Actually. Exactly. Yeah. Just yeah. be like, yeah, you know, it's not that big a deal to make a mistake about something or to be wrong about something, but you got to, you, you got to be self-aware and you got to, and people have to know that you're self-aware that you're not just like oh, all wrapped yeah. up in the ego of it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. All and right. in trading, we're wrong lots. <laughs> yeah. Right. No. Right. You gotta be, yeah. You gotta get used That's to it. A, That's for sure. Exactly. So I'm going to, I'm going to play number 87 though. Um, next in the, in the lottery because it's your 87th podcast, right? So I feel like that's gotta be, that's gotta be a lucky number somehow. So. Oh, let's hope so. Right to, Wonderful. Yeah. Let's hope so. Awesome. Let's hope well, so. That's going, that's going to conclude today's episode of Confessions okay. of a Market Maker. If you guys enjoyed the show, please rate and review it for us. If you'd like to join JJ, myself, and a supportive community of traders, you can join us at microefutures.com. Stacy, uh, let the people know where they can find you and uh, anything else you'd like them to know. Sure. Uh, thank you, gentlemen and gorillas, uh, both, all, all species <laughs> I'd like to extend a, a thanks to. And yeah, you can find me at uh, Stacy W underscore DC on Twitter. 
And I uh, spent a lot of time on Twitter uh, for sure. Uh, fair, you know, some, some amount of time on Twitter and uh, yeah. Awesome, JJ. Okay. JJ, Thank parting uh, parting words. Oh, it was like a breath of fresh air having you on. Thank you so much for being with us. <laughs> no, thank you wonderful. so much. It was great. It was great fun for sure. And I don't say that to all the gorillas either. So, <laughs> <laughs> Stacy, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Thanks so much for just sharing your experience and your thoughts. And you know, best of luck um, in the future. I know you guys are going to do well. All right, can't wait to come back. All right. Okay. okay. So Bye, for for Stacy Warden. Oh, where's the music? There it is. I'm Paulie Walnuts. He's the gorilla of Howe Street. You stop, so.